The following program has been arranged by the Division of Game and Fish. Here is the story of the Bluegrass State's Great Outdoors. This is Kentucky Afield. Kentucky Afield. Welcome to Kentucky Afield. Kentucky Afield. More than 50 years. And still. Fit as a fiddle. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Thank you, Ron Rohde. It's cold outside, and I have no desire whatsoever to go swimming. I don't even want to be caught in a cold rain. But what if you fall into water this time of year? Water's cold. In our program today, we look at the cold subject of cold water survival. Marine Law Enforcement Officer Shane Carrier and Boating Education Coordinator Zach Campbell for the State of Kentucky. Join us as we go Inside Outdoors on Kentucky Afield Radio. I never knew I had an artistic flair until my best friend put a paintbrush in my hand. More people are finding hidden interest because someone first took an interest in them. Most of my groceries come from my garden. My neighbor taught me how. If you're a sportsman or a sportswoman, who's the hidden hunter in your life? Asking someone to come along just might create lifelong interest. It'll be a great trip. Got your camo? Take aim on sharing a tradition. Got it. After all, someone did it for you. Google Kentucky Hunting to learn more. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear, flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The natural tax shelter. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and you know one thing. Winter isn't the time for pleasure boating. But some adventurous types still like to get out and boat when it's cold. Kayakers, for one, I used to be one. Whitewater canoe, duck hunters, fishermen. Today, we're talking about the subject of cold water immersion. I hate cold water. That's just one thing I hate in life is... Being spla- even splashed with cold water, I don't even like a cold shower. I don't like a squirt gun. I don't like being uh, hit with a water hose uh, you know, while you're washing the car, funneling around. And one thing that these things all share in common, besides the fact I just don't like that kind of stuff, is that it comes by surprise. I'm not ready for it. I don't like being splashed even when it's hot outside. Now, the fact is, you don't have to be on a boat to come into contact with cold water. You may be on a boat dock. Something startles you. Get your attention. Next thing, there's a misstep, and you are in the water. Today's guests are expert in the field of dealing with water, cold water, water rescue, boating safety. They are Major Shane Carrier, Kentucky's Boating Law Administrator, and Conservation Law Enforcement Officer. That's a lot of hats you wear. (laughs) <laughs> Major, and Zach Campbell, Kentucky's Boating Education Coordinator. Zach, welcome. Thank you. Glad, Glad to be here. here. This is not the time of the year to fall in the water. And I, I'm curious from a safety perspective. I don't really know where to go with this other than to say, I hope it doesn't happen to you. And if it does, are you a goner? Well, it's like most things in life, you want to prepare. If you're going to be out on the water... You need to know some of the uh, things that are going to keep you safe if the worst does happen. The most important thing, whether the water's cold or whether it's warm, is uh, to have your life jacket on board. I mentioned a minute ago that I was, once upon a time, a kayaker. And a friend of mine who is one of those died in the wool, I mean, it doesn't doesn't matter any time of the year, he will be out there doing this. And Mm -hmm. he had a plan, he had a formula. He said if the water temperature and the air temperature equal added together equal at least 100, Mm -hmm. he'll go. I guess my point is, how cold is cold water? It's defined as below 70 degrees. If you're in it long enough, you can start to get hypothermia over a matter of time. So a lot of people think cold water, really freezing cold water is what's going to affect you. Uh, Below 70 degrees can can really start to bother you. I was uh, at the beginning of the week uh, actually in 49-degree water. 
uh, we, we were doing uh, some pictures for the Kentucky Field Magazine, and being the team player I am, decided to be a, <laughs> uh, a model. So we, we got me out, threw me in the water, wearing my life jacket. The pictures are, are illustrating um, things that would save my life. Obviously, the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife officers were the main reason that uh, my life would have gotten saved in these pictures. But uh, wearing my life jacket, and I was portraying a duck hunter, a uh, waterfowl hunter, that whose boat had gone under. So one of the main things besides the the life jacket is I wasn't wearing waders. So there's a lot of things you can do to protect yourself. The people who this will most likely affect, who are probably the biggest listeners to this program, would be sportsmen and women, people who like to fish, people mm-hmm. who like to hunt, people who like to boat. That is correct. Now, let me mm-hmm. ask you, Major Carrier, do you run into this in the field or on the lake or on the river where these sportsmen and women really don't see themselves as boaters and all this boating safety malarkey just doesn't apply to them? It's very common, unfortunately, uh, and you are correct. Most of the people that we will see on the water this time of year are sportsmen. We have some cold water fishermen. They like to get out and brave the elements. They'll fish all winter long, as long as there's, you know, the lake's not frozen. We will have a tremendous amount of duck hunters that will take to our lakes and streams during the winter months. We don't have as many recreational boaters. I have seen skiers out. Skiers? Uh, it's not uncommon for them to wear a bodysuit and ski during the winter months, but it's uh, it's rare. It's it's geographic specific. Some lakes will have a, a ski club that will try to try to ski through the winter months, but primarily it's our sportsmen. And what I've noticed is they are concentrating more on their quarry, ducks or fish, and they get distracted by what they're doing, making sure they have all their decoys, all their equipment's in order, and they forget about the boating aspect of it and exactly how much danger they could potentially be in because of the cold water. I don't want to pick on people who hunt ducks and fish in the winter. That's perfectly legitimate pastimes, and they can go and they can do well at it, and they uh, love their day. That's absolutely correct. They just need to be conscientious that the water that they're out there on during the winter months uh, participating in these sports is entirely different than what they've spent this summer, you know, maybe recreational boating with the family, swimming in those same waters. If they end up in those waters uh, during these winter months, the uh, outcome could be significantly different. They're going to notice uh, the onset of hypothermia very quickly. It's going to affect their swimming ability. They're going to have a lot more clothes on to stay warm just because of the elements. When you get in the water with those additional clothing, when they get saturated... It it makes swimming that much tougher. We have an entire program to devote to cold water immersion and how to save your butt if you fall in, regardless if you're fishing or you just trip and fall or who knows what. You never know. Chances are it's not going to happen to the vast majority of the people. But interesting to know what they should do should it happen. Yeah, Just to have this in your pocket in case that day ever comes. You were talking about the article in Kentucky Field Magazine in the current issue, winter of 2012-13, and you fell in. Now, you could go in with neoprene on and something that would keep you warm even in despite the fact it was 49-degree water. But you weren't wearing any of this, where you just had on your regular street clothes. If I were an actual waterfowl hunter at the exact day that I was out, I wouldn't have been wearing all that warm stuff because it was it was pretty warm outside i mean the probably about 60 degrees that day and, and uh i wasn't wearing any neoprene i wasn't wearing any of that but um if uh one thing about that event i had gone in uh six or seven times and when you're talking about the uh, one of the rules of uh, uh cold water immersion you've got three steps to that the steps are one ten and one that stands for one minute ten minutes and one hour so that first minute is the immersion factor. You get in there, you go into cold shock. That's when people get into a lot of trouble because you get involuntary breathing and gasping and you, and you suck in water. That definitely happened when I went in. So that first step happened. 
um, then you've got your uh, 10. Uh, that After that first first minute, the 10 minutes after, is when you start to lose your motor skills. You start to lose the way your extremities, they're not performing properly. So all your, your blood's being drawn to the center of your body. And that really surprised me that the way that that happened after I was in the water for such a long time I was five feet from the dock and reaching out to the officer and uh, I could I could no longer swim to get to him so you could not swim I five not feet swim. from the dock no my my uh, there was a slight breeze which which was catching my life jacket um, and just that slight breeze I, I could swim uh, if my life depended on it, I couldn't have saved my life if uh, I was actually in that situation. I want to talk more about this. We're up against the break, but we'll be back talking with Zachary Campbell, the Kentucky Boater Education Coordinator, and Major Shane Carrier, Conservation Officer and Boating Law Administrator. We will be back on Kentucky Field Radio. listening to Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. In the studio talking about survival of sorts, cold water survival. If you fall in, if you're boating this time of year, boating in cold water, these are the folks that are in the studio with me that know a little bit about that. It's Kentucky's Boating Education Coordinator, Zachary Campbell, and Major Shane Carrier, a conservation officer, and also serves as Kentucky's Boating Law Administrator. Here's a it's just something interesting to keep in mind. It may be January. It may be February or March. It may mm-hmm. have a sunny day, and it may turn off to be beautiful. Exactly. That water is still cold. Yeah, the, the, the warm days that we experience in the winter doesn't change the water temperature. It doesn't warm up that significantly that much during these warm days. Um, I was down in Kentucky Lake yesterday and, uh, lots of boaters out, lots of fishermen, crappie fishing, but they need to realize that that water temperature is still, you know, 48 to 52 degrees, um, which is still very, very dangerous if they fall into it. So, Zach, you were talking a little bit in the break that you would expect boating fatalities to occur when there's more boats on the water, more crowded, uh, like a uh, yeah. busy highway of sorts. Your, your summer months and, and your uh, early fall months, that's where all the re- boating recreators are out. They're out having a good time, and uh, the water's warm, uh, but there's a lot of traffic. So you would, you would expect that most of your fatalities and accidents happen during that time. And um, like you said, uh, Major Carrier, it's it's the water's still cold at certain types of the year, and one of the most dangerous par- times of the year is spring. Everyone looks around, and the birds are chirping, uh, flowers are blooming, but it takes that water a long time to heat up, and the water's still really cold. So I, I went through um, all our Kentucky boating fatalities accidents from 2003 to current, and uh, I, I broke it up in between uh, uh, um, winter, summer, category um uh, fall fall summer category and winter spring category so we got your cold water months and your warm water months and uh surprisingly even though there's so much more activity during the summer and the fall uh it was uh there were 72 total fatalities and there was 36 in the summer it was a dead even and 36 in in the in the cold water months so it was split 50 50 50 that would lead me to believe that maybe I'm guessing that in the warm water months, I'm going to guess somebody may be partying too hard or uh, took a spill on their skis. I don't know. I'm guessing. And in the winter, has to be cold water related. Uh, how, how close am I? I think that's a very accurate assumption based on our statistics. A lot of the summertime months were they could have been uh, fatalities due to boat accidents or, like you said, fell out, hit the head. Something like that that caused an injury or a drowning. Wintertime, it's almost, I would say, primarily due to the cold water and the hypothermia and the uh, decreased ability to swim effectively. We have a saying around the boating community, your life jacket's got your back. Now, where do they fit into the scheme of things for saving your life in cold water? Um, I when I spoke earlier about that one ten and one uh, deal, um, 
that that applies if you're wearing a life jacket. Uh, you can survive uh, that one minute. You can, if you're not wearing a life jacket and that initial cold water shock, you can suck in water and and go under right then. So when you fall in, it is just a shock to your body. Mm-hmm. Now, I've not done it, and I'm not planning to do it to to learn. But you, you say it happened to you in the magazine shoot. But you fall in and go. <gasps> That's exactly right. And no different than when you described at the beginning, somebody throwing cold water on you. It so-called takes your breath, as everyone says. It takes your breath away. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's that the ten minute part where where you're you're getting used to the water, but you're lo- losing your motor skills and you're losing your ability to swim. Okay, um, if you don't have a life jacket on, you're not going to make it to that third step. You're not going to uh, even make it to hypothermia because before you. Uh, you're going to go under. You're not going to be able to swim without your life jacket. You're not going to be able to float. Uh, so li- wearing your life jacket is the way to avoid yeah, that. The life jacket will keep you afloat. It will protect you from drowning. It will not protect you from hypothermia. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just say this. I'm a good swimmer. I don't need a life jacket. Well, that's you couldn't be any further from the truth by that statement, uh, especially in cold water. I don't fool with uh, those that, things. I know how to swim. Well, um that is a misleading con- misconception uh, among the boating public. Uh, regardless of how well of a swimmer you think you are, uh, you, you're, you can drown easily uh, without a life jacket. Warm warm water or cold water, but especially so in cold water. So when you're swimming, especially it seems like it would be double, doubly bad in cold water that you have fallen in. It could be that your boat took a mistur. You fall in. When you fall in, you fall in by surprise. Yeah, you don't plan for you it. You don't so. plan these things. And you may have a uh, you may have a fish hook in your finger. You may have one in your cheek. You may have waders on, and next thing you know, they're filling up. Mm-hmm. Um, you could have hit your head when you fail. Absolutely. And if you're unconscious, the life jacket will still float you. Chances are you're going to be mad, mm-hmm. or you're going to say. I hope nobody saw this. Mm-hmm. What do I do now? This is not supposed to happen to me. And when you fall in uh, and you're not wearing your life jacket, uh, if you've got it stored on the boat and you're, you're, you're following the law and you have a life jacket per person on your vessel, it's, it's so easy just to wear it because, if, like we said, if you fall in, you fall in by surprise. You're not going to be able to, to most likely get back in your boat or put your life jacket on. You need to have it on when, before you fall in. We have a feeling like government is telling me what to do, and I don't like that. Or a mother has said, son, I told you not to run with those scissors. And it sounds a lot like that. But there's some truth to this, that if you're in a boat, if you're on the water, wearing a life jacket, may not keep you warm, but it'll save your life by letting you breathe. And cold water immersion here is the focus of this conversation. Because if you're cold... You are quickly becoming able, unable to dog paddle to That's keep correct. yourself afloat. That's correct. Now we we can presume you are hopefully at least with somebody. We're assuming that you are not in the middle of Lake Barkley. That's right. Um, we, there there are some things that we hope if this happens doesn't enter into your situation, but it might. It could, yes. We we recommend having someone with you just in case something like this happens. But every day we have sportsmen go out on our, our waters in these cold weather months by themselves. And uh, that is an increased risk that they are taking. But if they take proper precautions ahead of time and prepare, as Zach said, their chances of survival if they end up in the water increase greatly. I'm gonna I'm gonna venture a guess. If this were to happen to me, now correct me when I'm wrong here. If this were to happen to me, first thing I'm gonna do is panic. It's gonna mm-hmm. be cold, yes. and I am going to freak out, trying to get warm again. And if my boat is there, I guess I'm gonna try to climb up in the boat. Mm-hmm. If the boat has drifted away, and I can't, well, what do I do? What can I do to help me, to help myself? Well, uh, there's a, a posture that the, the boating safety community says that you should adapt. It's, it's called uh, uh, HELP. It's uh, heat, 
escape lessening posture. And it's basically you just, and this only works again if you're wearing your life jacket because uh, you, you bring your knees to your chest, um, and you, you pretty much get the, uh, assume the fetal position while you're out there floating. And that helps for less, um, uh, heat to, uh, ex- escape your body. You can stay out there longer and hope that, uh, you can be rescued in time. Now, let's say you're doing this, but you know it's probably going to be a lost cause. I've been in Lake Cumberland, mm-hmm. and my boat, this was summertime. I was by myself. It was an outboard boat. It ran out of gas. Mm-hmm. I said, well, I can uh, s- swim to shore. Harder to do than you think, even in warm summer weather. Mm-hmm. Harder to do. Where does help come from? How do you call for it? It's winter. It's winter. I Where does say. this help come from? You have to, the first person to help you save yourself is you. It's you. That's exactly right. Because there are so few people on our water during these cold weather months, the uh, chances of someone coming along to help you are pretty slim, actually. Um, you can hope for that there's another duck hunter out there that comes by or maybe a winter fisherman, but the uh, the crowded lakes of summer are not there. There's just not that many people to render assistance during those cold weather months so you're right it's going to be uh, up to you and how you prepared yourself to save you unfortunately the majority of the time i want to talk more about hypothermia itself when it sets in it's not immediate but when we come back talking about cold water immersion cold water in a sense cold weather survival if you happen to be a water lover or a boater or a hunter or a fisherman, duck hunter, we'll talk more with Major Shane Carrier, Kentucky's Boating Law Administrator and Boating Education Coordinator, Zachary Campbell, when we come back. This is Kentucky Field Radio. This is Kentucky Field Radio. I am Charlie Baglin. We continue our conversation about surviving in cold water this half hour with two experts in the field of marine safety. And no, I agree, it probably won't happen to you, ever. But it's pretty neat to hear what to do in that one in a billion chance that it ever does. First up, this week's fishing report. In western Kentucky, with all the rain we've been having, the lake levels have been up. The gates have been open in both Kentucky and Berkeley, so a lot of current. Water's muddy and cold, so fishing conditions are pretty tough right now. So that's why I'm saying if you can find you a sunny day and go out and cast the rocky shoreline, you might catch you some black crappie or some yellow bass. They're catching a few white crappie out in the deep. Again, the water needs to settle down some. The wind needs to quit blowing, and you can spider rig or vertical fish out there along the ledges for those crappie using jigs and minnows. The bass fishermen... They're catching a few fish around the docks, but most of the bass are also coming from the deeper secondary points and woody structure out there in that deeper water. Again, the tailwaters are all messed up with all the gates being open, so they're not doing any good in the tailwaters. It's kind of up and down. There's fish out there to be caught. Be careful. This is Paul Reister, hoping you find a good day to go fishing. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central District Fishing Report. Fishing across the district currently is pretty tough due to recent cold weather conditions. However, a few sauger are being caught below many of our locks and dams on the Ohio and Kentucky rivers here in the Central Fishery District. McAlpin and Markland, lock and dams are very popular areas, especially this time of year for sauger anglers. Try fishing uh, live minnows on jigs or fishing. Fishing a variety of jigs, spoons, or any type of minnow imitating lure can catch these fish. Additionally, it's a great time of year to get out and try your luck at catching a few trout. Trout have been stocked at many of our fins lakes. Check out our department website at fw.ky.gov to get a complete list of those fins lakes in your area. Good luck, good fishing, and hope to see you on the water. Hi, this is Eric Cummins with your Southwest Kentucky Fishing Report. Barron River Lake has been falling about three quarters of a foot each day this past week and water is still dingy on the lower end of the lake. Bass spite has been good in the clear sections and 15 to 20 foot of water on jerk baits and jigs. Likewise, crappie have been good in about 12 to 15 foot of water near drop-offs and structure. At Green River Lake, the lake is at winter pool. Bass bite is fair on jigs, jerk baits, and swim baits. 
15 to 25 foot of water. Don't forget to pack a float and fly rig for smallmouth fishing on chunk rock banks and slides in the lower half of the lake. Musky fishing also has been fair in the backs of coves with colored water on jerk baits and lipless crank baits. If you're on the water, be sure to keep that life jacket on all day. And as always, good luck and good fishing. 50 degree water, 50 minutes immersion, 50-50 chance of losing your life. You need to know what to do to save your own life because there may be no one else around to save you. More on the topic with our guest after the break next on Kentucky Afield Radio. In a world ruled by ducks. Duck hunters, take note. Statistics show that each year, more hunters die from drowning than from gun mishaps. Hey, Larry, let's get started. The ducks are waiting. I know, I know. I just feel like I forgot something. <coughs> no, we got it all. Guns, shells. <coughs> What'd you say? That wasn't me. We got the boat, hot coffee. What could we possibly be missing? <coughs> Duck season is upon us, and the law requires that hunters have a life jacket for each person in the boat. It's also a good idea to wear them. In the cold waters of duck season, a fall overboard can cause your muscles to stiffen, making it nearly impossible to swim or stay afloat. And that's before hypothermia sets in. So bring and wear your... Life jackets. That's what we forgot. A message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. In the studio with me are cold water experts, boating experts, Major Shane Carrier with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife's Law Enforcement Division. And he is also the boating law administrator. So if it has to deal with the boating law in this state, it passes your desk, doesn't it, Doc? It does. And Zachary Campbell... Kentucky's Boating Education Coordinator. You know, we all get this sense of, God, I'm glad that wasn't me. When mm-hmm. we're watching the evening news and they talk about these harrowing rescues or somebody who saved themselves a skiing accident or somebody buried in an avalanche or somebody on a boat, it would have been sure death, but yet they rose above it and somehow lived to tell the story the next day or the next week. We're talking about cold water immersion, and you spent a good number of years in the field, Major Carrier. I did. Where were you in the state of Kentucky on patrol? I I primarily patrolled uh, Taylorsville Lake, which lays uh, in Spencer County and a little in Anderson and partially in Nelson. I spent the majority of my career just about every weekend on Taylorsville. I also spent some time patrolling the Ohio River around the uh, Louisville-Jefferson County area and also... Uh, a little bit on Rough River Lake down in Breckenridge County. The Kentucky so, wildlife boating folks mm-hmm. aren't the only unit folks out there that are that are interested in this. I know there's a unit of uh, the Coast Guard in, in Louisville, and uh, th- there's a few of you scattered around. But the, there is. Mm-hmm. The group that is in charge of recreational boating law enforcement in this state is? Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Conservation Officers. We are charged with enforcing... All of the uh, boating laws for the Commonwealth. So we spend uh, a large percentage of our time on the water uh, enforcing these laws. Without and, mentioning names or bringing up any bad memories, can you describe uh, some harrowing incidents that you've seen? I can. I have uh, a couple of instances that come to mind. Uh, one involved uh, a fisherman on the Ohio River. Uh, we just happened to be out patrolling that day. And uh, it was not what I would call winter months. I'm, if recollection is right, it was probably late Octoberish. Water was still significantly cooler than it was during the uh, traditional summertime boating and swimming months. But the uh, fisherman had hit a submerged log, and uh, actually the motor had come loose from the transom of the boat. And the boat was taken on water, and it had actually uh, sank by the time we arrived. Uh, to where he was at. Luckily, uh, he was in a high population area uh, along the river where someone on the bank on the dock seen this happen. And uh, by the time we got there, he was uh, in the water. He'd been in the water maybe 15 minutes or so, but fortunately he was wearing his life jacket. 
but by the time we got to him and got him out of the water, we could already see the onset of hypothermia. Water temperature was probably 65 degrees, which sounds relatively warm, but uh, no longer than he was in the water, we were already starting to see the effects of it. He had extreme chills, uh, was already, you know, uh, color was leaving, uh, extremities were numb, he couldn't. Uh, we tried to uh, throw him a ring buoy. And uh, he was having trouble grabbing onto it, so we finally were able to, to maneuver our boat close enough that we could take uh, our boat hook that we keep on the boat and uh, hook to him and pull him in, so we could get him out of the water, and get him get him warmed up. So that's one instance that I can recall where I know without a doubt that uh, him having that life jacket on saved his life. Uh, and then, fortunately for him, there was there was we were close, or if there was someone close in a boat that could come and get him out of the water relatively quickly. You mentioned two or three things there that I think enter into this. One, it was it was late October. Mm-hmm. Had it been January, you may not have been as lucky. He may not have been as fortunate. That's correct. There may not have been somebody on the bank. That's exactly right. Fortunately, he, he was wearing a life jacket, and you had said he had been in the water for 20 minutes? Yeah, approximately 20 minutes. By the time we uh, ran upstream uh, to to get to him, uh, by the time the person on the on the bank actually noticed him, he was already his boat was partially sank, and he was already in the water. So, so 20 minutes, and he was so incapacitated that he could not reach out to grab a water ring. That's correct. Or could not grip a rope. Mm-hmm. Yep. That is hypothermia setting in. That is. That's exactly what that is. So when someone falls into the water and it is cold water, hypothermia, well, it isn't, inst- it isn't instant. Zach, you teach boating safety. How does hypothermia come up? What, what do you have to say? What's the minute message? As I spoke before about the, I'm bringing up that uh, good old uh, one ten and one again. Uh, after that first ten minutes, depending on how cold the water is, like you said, Major Carrier, that took 20 minutes. After that first 10 minutes, you can start feeling the effects of hypothermia, and then you have it up into a, around an hour, uh, depending on how cold the water is, and you can actually lose consciousness with the hypothermia. Once you get in, you start to lose the use of your extremities. You can go into shock. You can be out there floating. You can become disoriented. And say your your vessel goes under, your boat goes under, and, and there's still uh, it gets swamped and still a portion of it floating. Instead of trying to swim to safety, because as we've we've spoken, most likely you're not going to be able to swim in, in a short amount of time. It's good to get up on, as much of your body out of the water as possible and climb up on that vessel, so because uh, the air is much warmer than the water, and you can actually last longer until help arrives. 50 degree air temperature is much warmer than 50 degree water, for sure. Absolutely. So your fingers are going to go numb, your toes will go numb. Next, I assume your arms and your ability to do much, because all your blood is going to your heart to keep your core body temperature as warm as warm. it can be. Mm-hmm. And you can start to go into shock. From the experience when I was in the water, I was in about, you know, on and off about 20 minutes. Afterwards, I was really cloudy for the day. I remember coming back up to the office, and uh, it just takes a while for your core temperature to get back up. If you're out there, you can not know what direction you're swimming in. Uh, you can really lose your cognitive ability to make decisions, so it's it's quite a dangerous situation. Well, if I'm out there and this happens to me, I guess a first instinct would be, I'm going to swim to shore. Mm-hmm. Now, you were saying in the photo shoot, you were five feet away. You couldn't swim. Yes, five feet away from and, and the dock. But going into this, when you fall in, you're going to have an initial reaction to the cold water on your body. Now, nobody likes that. It's like stepping into a cold shower, getting splashed. After a minute or two, just like when you jump in the into a swimming pool, you get used to the water. Sure, yeah. And and that's the part that nobody wants to be in it long enough to get used to the water. I th- yeah, you get acclimated to it uh, rather quickly, and uh, you know once once you realize that you know death is not hypothermia is not going to kill you immediately as soon as you hit the water. But you, uh, have, you you have some time to think and get your thoughts straight and and make rational decisions before hypothermia sets in to the point that it. Like Zach says, it, it reduces those uh, abilities. So. so you may have 10 minutes or so where you are thinking clearly, sure. your body still works, and you can think this through. If you're wearing your life jacket. If you're wearing your life jacket. Good point. 
So how far away do you believe, you, how close do you have to be to shore to say, it's worth my time to leave this boat and swim to shore? The U.S. Coast Guard has done studies uh, throughout the um, nation as far as fatalities, and uh, most deaths occur 5 to 10 feet from safety. And these are people that fall in unexpectedly, mm-hmm. uh, gasp in water, and are not wearing life jackets. So if you're wearing your life jacket, um, really, I don't know. That, that depends on uh, how cold the water is, um, how busy the uh, body of water is as far as other people on the water. If you have... Um, if you've made a, a float plan and people know that you're out there, people know uh, um, where you are, where you're located, all those aspects uh, fall into that. Sure. Each situation is going to be different, and you're just going to have to make a conscious decision. If you got your life jacket on, you know, the chances of you drowning should be, you know, tremendously reduced. So now you're to the point, do I leave, you know, if my boat is partially floating, if it's giving me some flotation on top of my life jacket do i leave it and go to shore or do i stay with it and hope help comes so those are the things you're going to have to to look at and and make a conscious decision because you you need to get out of the water and dry it off and warmed up as soon as possible so i know i am guessing that sometimes the shore is a little farther away than you think water is very deceptive when it comes to judging distances it, it is a lot different than most people walking around every day on dry land can pretty well tell how far something is away it is really amazing how deceptive water can be things look much closer than they are when you think oh there i'm a good swimmer i can swim you know out to that buoy and back or i can swim from here to the bank and then once you get started and you're you know think you're almost there and look up and you're not even a third of the way it, it's very deceptive I'm wondering how many people are going to rem- if if they have heard this to begin with will remember this should crisis happen. I was doing a little bit of research before you all got here and it said if you actually start to swim to shore don't stop. Mm-hmm. Even if it's a little farther than you thought, if it's don't stop. Don't stop to you you reach your destination. That's correct. A, a trust that adrenaline will kick in. Mm-hmm. We're talking with Major Shane Carrier of many years, a wildlife boating officer, conservation officer with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now an office job, but still very much as, just as important with the boating law administrator for the state of Kentucky. Also in the studio, Zachary Campbell is the Kentucky Boating Education Coordinator. You teach a lot of people, Zach. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Some final thoughts when we come back for our last segment. Okay. Stay with us. My name's Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. I'm Charlie Baglin. Talking with Major Shane Carrier, Conservation Officer and Boating Law Administrator and uh, cold water survival expert of sorts, seeing what happens when people don't do it correctly. And Zachary Campbell, a boating education coordinator for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We have been talking this past hour about cold water immersion, cold water survival. It could happen to you if you're out ice skating on a pond and you break through the ice. Or it could happen to you if you're out fishing. It could happen to you if you're out kayaking. Mm-hmm. If you're hunting waterfowl. Did you just cite a statistic a, a little bit ago that waterfowl hunters, I don't want to pick on waterfowl hunters, but if that is the body that is predominantly using our waterways when it's cold. It is. We're talking to you. This could help save your life, make your, de- your, your hunting day a little bit better than it might otherwise be. Absolutely. Yeah, the... Uh the U.S. Coast Guard statistics show that waterfowl hunters, more of them die each year from drowning or hypothermia than than what most people would think would be firearms-related accidents because they're involved in a hunting sport, but actually it's drowning. It should be said, hunting is a safe sport. Fishing is a safe sport. What we're talking about when things will inevitably go awry. Absolutely. It's, and it can happen to you. It can, just because of the environmental factors that uh, we uh, 
are forced to operate in to participate in these sports. Uh, they they add an extra element to the whole survival aspect of it. My hat's off to anybody that will go out in a boat. And buddy, I've done it. My hat's off to myself. But you all you all recreate boat recreationally in in the winter. You uh-huh. go fishing or you all out there? Could this happen to you? I'm a big, big fisherman. Fish. Big fisherman. So. And I and I, I'm a big waterfowl hunter, so I can relate from both the uh, my occupation and from my personal experiences being in situations like this. I spend a lot of time on the water in the winter months. So we've established that if this happens to you, if you fall in, the best thing you can do is one wear a life jacket. Have your life jacket on and get out of the water as soon as possible and get dry clothing on, get warmed up. Uh, to prevent the onset of hypothermia. And Zach, you're saying even if your boat is three quarters of the way underwater, climb up on top of whatever's left of it. Yes, definitely. to get most of your body out of the water. Yes, and and uh, I I uh, like to also state that the best way is to prepare and make sure this doesn't happen. So there's some there's three main steps you you can take to keep yourself safe on the water. Say you're a, a fisherman in the winter or a waterfowl hunter. Especially on the waterfowl side, again, uh, you don't overload your boat. A lot, a lot of the accidents, uh, you can attest to this, uh, mm-hmm. major is that, uh, the waterfowl hunters have so many equipment that, uh, they overload the boat, uh, they don't have enough freeboard and water comes in and, and swamps the boat and they end up in the water. So, yeah, so safety equipment is, safety equipment is imperative. And, you know, waterfowl hunters, you know, traditionally hunt out of a smaller boat, so it's, uh, less conspicuous to the waterfowl hunters. It's easier to hide. It's probably not a boat that they use on a regular basis throughout the year. So it's smaller. They're carrying more equipment. They've got dogs. They've got decoys. They've got guns. Smaller boat. And they may have a, an inkling to leave maybe some of the required safety equipment behind thinking, well, we don't need that. Uh, it doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to me. And it couldn't be further from the truth because they probably will need it worse in those situations than they would have in the summertime in their recreational boating. There are life jackets you can wear and hardly ever see. Absolutely. What, what, what's the minute message on belt packs and uh, personal flotation devices and such, Zach? Well, with technology these days, we've got these great options. That, uh, a lot of the complaints uh, for fishermen that have to cast or waterfowl hunters that uh, have the gun up against their shoulder is that uh, the life jacket can be somewhat cumbersome and get in the way. Uh, we've got inflatable devices now where you, you've got your a normal life jacket that you put on. It's, it's very uh, light and uh, thin. It's, you barely even notice that it's on. Mm-hmm. It's a vest type. But... Yeah, yes, yeah, a vest. And uh, you've also got a belt pack that you can wear. And both of these models, you uh, you fall in the water, then they inflate. They have a, a, a cartridge, a CO2 cartridge that goes off and inflates the whole thing. It's a, it's a great way to, for it's a great way for waterfowl hunters and fishermen to not get their life preserver in the way when they're trying to do the sport they love. And even our officers use the inflatable vests. They're a great, a great new thing in technology. They are. And I would I would highly recommend that uh, if they're looking to purchase one of these, that they, they offer a manual uh, inflatable type and an automatic. The automatic adds another element of safety in the event that if you fall into the water and st- you know, you could potentially hit your head on the side of the boat or whatever it may be and uh, knock yourself unconscious. The automatic will still inflate. It's uh, water activated, which will inflate and keep your head above water uh, when you're wearing the vest type. Even if you're unconscious, it'll save you. Of course, it's not going to happen to me. And anybody listening, well, that's great, but it's not going to happen. It doesn't really apply to me. I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to do that. It won't happen to me. Uh, for some reason, I'm impervious to crisis in my life this is taught under your program zach of voter education where are these taught who should take them it's advised that everyone take a take the course it's they can be taught uh online we have them online you can take them get your voter education blue card uh our officers uh teach them every year so there's there's multiple opportunities for the public to take the course is there any final thought that you would want to leave folks with your life jacket's got your back. And we can't stress enough to wear your PFD. It's going to aid you in surviving. And the bottom line is if you fall in the water and it's extremely cold and there's no one there to get you out and you don't have a life jacket on, a you're whistle. not going to make it. A whistle. A life jacket and a whistle. And a whistle. Yeah, those inflatables we discussed, most of them have a whistle made on them. So built for in. that purpose, they're built in. 
But if you don't have that, you fall in this cold water, uh, no one's around to get you out immediately, you're not going to make it. Last question. Do you text and drive? No, sir. No. Your carrier? Absolutely not. There is more online to be found out about cold water immersion and boating safety from any number of sources. Now, the official website is fw.ky.gov. Next week on Kentucky Field, we go inside outdoors with a man in charge of a school program that has more kids fired up about going to school, making better grades, feeling pumped up about being part of a team than you could ever imagine. The Archery in the Schools program. Patrick O'Connell is Kentucky's new state coordinator, and he joins us along with one of the founding fathers of the program itself, now president of the National Archery in the Schools program. His name is Roy Grimes. We're out of time. i got to get. I'm Charlie Baglin. Join us again next week on Kentucky Afield Radio.